All right, quickly, we're going to run through the Civil War in 15 minutes or less. So here's your Civil War timeline. Uh, Civil War lasts from 1861 to 1865. All right, so in 1860, Abraham Lincoln is elected president in November. And as a result, South Carolina, who, as you remember, had threatened to secede during Jackson's presidency, actually secedes in December of 1860. They will be quickly followed by Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, and Texas. All right, in 1861, in February, those states that have seceded form the Confederate States of America. Okay, Jefferson Davis is going to be chosen as their president, and Fort Sumter is going to be the first shots that are fired in the Civil War, and your war begins. So, remember Lexington and Concord as your first shots of the American Revolution. You must also remember Fort Sumter, first shots of the Civil War. Right. After that incident, Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Arkansas are going to join the Confederacy as well. All right, some slave states are going to remain a part of the Union, and these states become known as border states because they literally are going to border the United States of America or the Union and the Confederate States of America, also known as the Confederacy. These states will be Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, and West Virginia, which now comes into existence because these are the western counties of Virginia that breaks away when Virginia decides to secede. So Virginia, as we knew it before, is part of the Confederate States of America, and those western counties form a new state, West Virginia. And Robert E. Lee is going to be chosen as the leader of the Confederate Army. Remember him as one of your leaders in the Mexican-American War for the United States of America. All right, the Anaconda Plan is your northern strategy for the Civil War. They want to cut off the South from trade and aid from other countries with a naval blockade. The South really just plans to fight a defensive war, which is what they are trying to do, is defend their right to them to exist as the Confederate States of America. The North will have nicknames as the Union, Yankees, the Blue. The South will have nicknames like the Confederacy, Rebels, because they've rebelled and left the United States, and the Gray. All right. Still in 1861, you have one of your first major battles, which is the Battle of Bull Run. Your Confederate General Stonewall Jackson is going to um, force Union forces to retreat. Uh, Julia Ward Howe is going to write the Battle Hymn of the Republic after this battle. All right, so looking at the sides of the war, your north and the south, and comparing them, uh, your northern advantages include that they have more resources, specifically more factories and raw materials. Uh, they have a larger population to draw on for soldiers. They definitely have better transportation systems. Remember we talked about how railroads were growing a lot more in the north and in the west and not so much in the south in previous units. So here's where that transportation and transportation systems are going to really aid the north in this war. And they also have more farmland that's dedicated to food. Okay, there's a lot of farmland and a lot of plantations in the South, but remember, cotton is king in the South. So they don't have a lot of the food resources that the North will have. Their Southern advantages include that they have better military leadership. Okay, um, they have more motivation. They're fighting for their independence, for their way of life, and they're also fighting primarily on their home turf. So when we do our Civil War map, you'll see that the majority of your battles are going to occur in the Confederacy. All right, your disadvantages. Um, for the North, they have poor military leadership. Okay, they've got more men that can fight, but they don't have the leaders to really lead them. Um, they are fighting away from home, and your soldiers lack motivation. Okay, they're not as motivated for this war as people from the South may be, considering they're fighting for their independence and for their way of life. Your southern disadvantages include that your northern blockade is going to hinder their trade, okay, that anaconda plan that we just talked about. Uh, inflation, okay, there's no gold or silver backing their currency. They're a new nation. So trying to get all of those things together and fight a war simultaneously are a little difficult. Their farmland is dedicated to cotton, and they do have a smaller population as well. All right, so 1862, you have... Um, one instance, 
far as naval battles are concerned, to make sure you remember, and that's Monitor versus Miramac. Um, this is the first battle of iron ships. They're also called ironclads. Um, another significant battle that happens in 1862 is your Battle of Antietam. And the significance of this battle is you have more casualties in one day than any other day in American history. This is the first attempt by the South to, instead of just fight a defensive war, to invade the North. Okay. Also in 1862, you have the Emancipation Proclamation. This is your order signed by Lincoln, freeing all the slaves in the Confederate States. It does not include your border states because those are part of the Union. So the Emancipation Proclamation is a statement by the president that the slaves in the rebelling states or in the Confederacy are free. Obviously, Lincoln does not control the Confederacy, so in effect, the Emancipation Proclamation does not free any of the slaves. That's why you need the 13th Amendment. Okay, your siege of Vicksburg. Vicksburg is a southern city, Mississippi, and it's put under siege by Union General Ulysses S. Grant. Um, this northern victory is very, very significant. It gives the Union complete control of the Mississippi River, in effect, splitting the South in two. Okay, your Battle of Gettysburg, another significant battle of the Civil War and known as the turning point of this war, is the second attempt by the South to invade the North. It is the largest battle in the Western Hemisphere and it's known as the turning point of the Civil War. Okay, you can also try to remember that by the G turning. Remember, we talked about the American Revolution, the Saratoga, the S turns, so it's the turning point of the war. The G also turns, so Battle of Gettysburg is your turning point of the Civil War. Okay, with the Gettysburg Address, which follows the battle, um, it's a speech that's made by Lincoln. It's dedicating the military cemetery at Gettysburg. Um, this is his most famous speech, uh, especially in the end where he says that a government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. So you start to get an idea of what Lincoln's plan may be as they hopefully wrap this war up. But remember we said this goes from 1861 to 1865, so we still have a little bit of time yet. All right, moving forward to 1864, uh, Ulysses S. Grant is going to take charge of the Union Army. He's the only Union general who's willing to go to the enemy. In a lot of instances, Lincoln's going to be very, very disappointed with his Union generals because they will pretty much have the Confederate Army within their grasp, but then they hold back. And Grant's like, no, we'll go for it. All right. Um, you have a lot of people as this wars continue to go on. Here we're talking about 1864, so it's gone on for about three years. And people are pretty much done. So you have this group of people who become known as Copperheads, and they're Northerners who are against the war. It's like, just let them be. Let the South have their new country. We're so over this war at this point. All right, in 64, Lincoln will be reelected. In his second inaugural address, he lays out his plan to reconcile with the South or bring the Union back together. And in it, he has the famous quote of, with malice towards none, so with hatred towards none, and charity for all. So let's just, let's bind this all back up. Let's get things back together and not be, you know, excessively mean about letting the South back into the United States. Okay. Also in 1864, General Sherman is having his march to the sea. So he's marching his soldiers down through Georgia. Uh, they're going to cut the South in half. And he is following a total war method. So he destroys absolutely anything and everything that would help the South keep fighting. So any roads, the few rail lines that they do have, uh, fields that could be used to grow food. He is burning and tearing everything up. And that definitely takes away from some morale and, and also keeps supplies very limited for your Confederate soldiers as well. Okay, 1865, things are looking very good for the South. And you have the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. Robert E. Lee is going to surrender to Grant. This signals the end of the war. Um, Lincoln will be assassinated by John Wilkes Booth just a few days after this surrender occurs at Ford's Theater. 
Um, Andrew Johnson, who was Lincoln's vice president, is going to become the president, and he does plan to follow Lincoln's lenient plan for reconciliation with the South. All right, Reconstruction is going to be the time period after the war when your southern states would be readmitted to the United States. Uh, some northerners, specifically your radical Republicans, believe that the South should be punished in some way for leaving the Union, for causing the war, all of this money that's been spent, all these lives that have been lost, they need to be punished. Lincoln had been totally against that idea. Remember in his second inaugural address, he says, with malice towards none and charity for all. So they're very opposite ends of the spectrum. All right, when Andrew Johnson tries to follow through with Lincoln's plan, he is going to very much anger your radical Republicans. They come up with a way to impeach him. He's found not guilty and he serves the rest of his term as president, but he does have to go through the impeachment process. Okay, after the war is over, there are some things that need to be settled, specifically the issue of slavery. That leads you to your Civil War amendments or your Reconstruction amendments, 13, 14, and 15. The 13th Amendment abolished slavery in the United States, so slavery is no longer legal. Uh, your 14th Amendment is going to make all individuals who are born or naturalized in the United States citizens and so that's supposed to also give them equal protection under the law, right? This would include your former slaves. Uh, and then your 15th Amendment states that citizens can't be stopped from voting because of their race, color, or status of previous servitude. So had they been slaves before, you cannot stop them from voting. There will be laws that are going to be put in place called black codes that will keep African-American males from voting with things like grandfather clauses, that if your grandfather was a slave, or no, no, sorry, if your grandfather could vote, then you're able to vote. Well, obviously, in that instance, if you were a freed slave, you will not be able to vote because your grandfather had been a slave and could not vote. So 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are your Reconstruction Amendments, and they go in logical order. First, you must free the slaves, then make them citizens, and then you can allow them to vote. So 13, 14, 15, free citizens vote. All right, your Freedmen's Bureau is your federal agency that's set up to help your, your former slaves after the Civil War. They'll offer things like job training, education, things to try to get them assimilated into American society from their slave status to being citizens. Okay, a few terms to remember within this unit. Uh, carpetbaggers, they're your northerners who moved to the south after the war for economic and political gain. Okay, your scalawags are your southerners who helped the carpetbaggers. And conscription is required military service. You may see these three terms as we go through this unit. Uh, a few little extras to make note of are individuals who have special honors from the Civil War. Uh, one is William Carney. He's your first African-American to win the Congressional Medal of Honor. And then Philip Bazaar, who's your first Hispanic American to win the Congressional Medal of Honor. Okay, so that wraps up your timeline sheet. Make sure that you have that uh, ready to go next time in class.